Now, what I am trying to do as I teach these songs, I'm trying to give you what I feel to be the accurate doctrinal and uh, prophetic interpretation of the passage. I'm not dealing primarily with David's circumstances when he wrote these, nor am I striving to teach a devotional message from these psalms. Now, certainly when it comes to devotion, the Psalms are the greatest place to begin. But what I want you uh, to understand and to see is the, the correct, what I think is to be the correct Bible teaching, and what, the, what prophetically and doctrinally the text is teaching. And um, this passage, of course, like most of the Psalms, looked forward to a period in the Bible we call the Great Tribulation, or the Tribulation Period. And it deals with a remnant of Jews who feel themselves to be cut off from all parts and having no hope. And uh, they will find the nations to be unfaithful. These nations will use deceit in order to destroy them, this remnant. And during that period of time, they will cry to the Lord, and the Lord will arise and save them. And uh, certainly another point is that all men are liars. And uh, therefore, his word, God's word, is the only faithful word. And it has been preserved to every generation. So first of all, you'll notice in this text something similar to what you see in all of the other psalms. You see the prominence of the ungodly. And you see the prayer for the ungodly to be cut off. Now that tells you immediately that when you deal with these psalms, you're dealing with something entirely different than, than what we're dealing with in the church age. You don't find, or seldom do you find, a group of Christians getting together praying for God to kill their enemies or to destroy, to destroy the wicked. And uh, you may feel that way sometime, and you may like to pray that, but that's a sign that you're not in the, in the, in walking in the Spirit. Because uh, if God destroyed all the wicked, you wouldn't be any better off. In fact, because you and I still have wicked hearts, so we, our hearts are deceitful, and uh, this earth is not our home. Heaven is our home. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, the Christian, uh, he, his citizenship is in heaven. And the answer for our dilemma is not the destruction of the wicked. Uh, the answer for our dilemma is the return of Christ and the rapture of the church. But as far as an earthly kingdom ever being established on this earth, with Israel being the head of, those, of that kingdom, the wicked must be destroyed. And the wicked will be destroyed. And so, as you read these psalms, you see, first of all here, it talks about the prominence of, of the ungodly. Look at verse 1 and 2. Help, Lord, for the ungodly man, see, or for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. Now, when the prominence of the godly ceases, uh, you know, when, when, they, when they disappear, when the godly... Uh, become few and fail to speak up, then the next thing you have is the, the promotion of wickedness. And uh, this is what we have here. They, uh, he said, help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. Uh, the condition existed when the Lord Jesus was on this earth. Uh, he found not a nation willing to repent. He didn't find, even though you find at times thousands of people came out to hear Christ, by and large, the nation rejected him. And they said, we'll not have this man to rule over us. And uh, in time, there was just a little handful of people who were faithful to Christ. And at the cross, it was just his mother and John and a few Roman soldiers standing around. And all the disciples fled and forsook him. And at his crucifixion, after that, Thomas said, uh, I won't believe unless I'm able to put my hands in the prints of his uh, of the nails and in his side Peter said I'm going to go fishing so you find that when our Lord came to the end of his ministry he didn't have a big following like you might think uh, by and large there were very few even his disciples were worldly and self-serving and seeking promotions and positions and fighting among themselves someone said the treasurer was a thief and the chairman of the deacon board was cussing and swearing and the others were wondering who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom how would you like for a group of men to be arguing about that at your deathbed and that's what they were doing at the very night Jesus was going to uh, the night he was going to be apprehended so uh, 
uh, when, when, when the godly cease to stand for God, obviously wickedness prevails. And this is what was going on uh, when our, and during our Lord's ministry. You find the same thing in Israel during the time of Elijah. Go back, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 19. Let me show you a passage. 1 Kings 19. Uh, Elijah was, a, was zealous for God. Uh, he was a prophet of prophets. And he cried out against the wickedness that was in the land. He was burdened because it appeared that no one cared about soul winning. No one cared about the Bible. No one cared, really cared about God. And Elijah uh, found that uh, in his own thinking that he was a lonely man. And uh, look at what he says in 1 Kings 19 verse 9. It says, And he came thither to a cave, and he lodged there. And the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel. Notice, it's the children of Israel. The children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. They have thrown down thine altars. That's his own people. Those are the Jews. Tearing down their own altars. They've forsaken God's covenant. Watch this. They have slain thy prophets with the sword. Those are the Jews killing their own people. They're killing the prophet, their own prophets and forsaking their own covenant and tearing down their own altars. And he said, uh, uh, he said, notice it said that they have slain the prophets with the sword and I, even I only am left and they seek my life uh, to, uh, to take it away. Now here was a man that uh, he felt that he was all alone. Now God encouraged him and said, there's 7,000 people, 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. But here's what bothers me is Elijah didn't know it. Now, why didn't he know all these, these other professing believers existed? Evidently, they weren't making enough noise. And you know what? Uh, nothing is worse than a professing Christian being quiet when he ought to speak up. How many times have you been in a situation where uh, someone just sat there and never opened their mouth and, and uh, you know, and never, you know, you don't know whose side they're on. I say the guy that won't speak up is not on your side. I can tell you that. And he may call you later and say I was on your side, but now he's just playing both ends against the middle. You need to speak up and stand up for what's right. And when somebody's doing right, go to stand up for them. And thank God for these prophets that had not bowed their knee to the image of Baal, but they weren't saying anything. And if they were, Elijah wasn't hearing them. And he thought he was all alone. And uh, you know, when you Christians keep quiet and you're at work, you, you know, there's some of you that, that if I talked to your fellow employees and told them you were a Christian, they'd, they'd laugh. They'd say, Christian? And yet those same people go to church on Sunday. They're sitting in churches all around the country. You, say, you ought to speak up at work, and you ought to have some gospel tracts, and you ought to pass them out. And someone asks you why you don't do such a thing, you ought to say, because I'm a Christian. See? You ought to speak up. It's a shame that there's one or two people at the place of employment trying to stand up for God and 50 other professing Christians who do nothing but hinder the testimony of Christ. There's a young man here today, young man here today, I, he's, he's not been saved very long, and he's been standing up for, for the Lord at work, and you know who gives him the most trouble? Backslidden Christians. They were comfortable until he spoke up, but now he makes them feel guilty and good for him. Good for him. And uh, so you need to speak up. And here was a situation that David felt. The godly man was, was disappearing. Now, prophetically, this passage looks forward to that very difficult time uh, when, uh, before Jesus returns to this earth. Would you go to Luke 18 and see what kind of conditions you've got there? Go to the Luke, Gospel of Luke and uh, look at chapter 18. And this passage fits right in here. Luke chapter 18. Look at verse, uh, verse 1, <coughs> 18, 1. And he spake a parable to them, to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Help, Lord, for the godly ceaseth, saying... There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man, and there was a widow in that city. And she came to him, saying, Avenge me, mine adversary, and he would not for a while. But afterwards he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. 
And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his, his own elect? Now pay attention to verse 7. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry unto him day and night, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. That is, the Lord will come and take vengeance on those that are persecuting this widow. And this widow is Israel. The widow is the nation of Israel. And, uh, and uh, she's not being represented properly, uh, primarily because she has not repented. But during the tribulation period, there will be that remnant that will cry to God day and night. And that's what that's about. Now look at verse 8. I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Well, if the Lord came today, he'd find a lot of professing Christians, wouldn't he? Today, there's probably more Christians in Seattle this morning than were in Jerusalem during our Lord's time. There are a lot of Christians, and I mean truly saved people, in, every, in most of the cities, especially in America, in, uh, in the Philippines, in Korea, and some of the other countries. There, there are lots of Christians. But the time is coming when the rapture takes place and all born-again people are out of here. Then God starts dealing with the Jewish nation and a remnant will come and begin to stand up for Christ and for the Bible, just like John the Baptist did and the 12 and the 70 and Peter and the others. And the great persecution that appeared in the book of Acts will occur again. And this remnant will find that the godly have ceased and uh, the wicked will become prominent during that period. Now, what do they call it, the Great Tribulation? And uh, as they become more wicked, they become more bold. Let's go back to Psalm 12. Watch what happens in verse 8. And uh, when, the, when the ungodly become prominent and bold and the, wicked is, uh, the most wicked men are promoted and exalted, look at verse 8. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest of men are exalted. Now, you ought to think about that. When vile people are exalted into high position, it just brings wickedness out of the closet. See? And that, you know, some people say, well, it's, it's just, I mean, uh, you know, it's just as bad to think it as it is to say it. But don't be that stupid. It's not as bad to, to think it as it is to say it. What I think hurts me. What I say hurts multitudes of people. See? And, uh, you know, I mean, you know, this idea, well, you know, everybody's sinning so they can sin in public. Why be a hypocrite? I don't know. Why sin? So in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, it says, Righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness exalts a nation. You ever wonder why America's having so much trouble? I know why. Because she ceased to be righteous. That's why righteousness, not, not education, not more money for, for, for the welfare department, not more taxes, not more education, go on for education and all of those things. But listen, if you think education makes righteous men, you're a fool. Neither will more dollars funnel down your alley. That won't do it. It's righteousness that exalts a nation. And when you kick God out of government and out of the classroom and out of your house and out of your church, you got nothing left but a vacuum. You know, there's nothing as pathetic as watching some of these folks trying to say, well, I think the problem is this. I think the solution is this. You know what I say as I watch them? I say, I think you don't think. Really. I mean, it's pathetic. It's pathetic. You know, I don't want to get on that. No, I don't want to get on that. You guys are watching me get lynched. I know you. Okay. Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. When Ahab ruled, wickedness filled the land. This was so in our Lord's day, and it reach, reaches, it'll reach a climax in the tribulation when the man of sin rules. You'll notice in our text, it talks about when the wicked puffeth at him. Look at verse 3. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh with uh, proud things, who hath said, uh, hey, let's see, where's that word? Brown to verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, 
No, that's not what I'm after. Verse 5, okay. The, oppress, the oppression of the poor, for the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. And that him that puffeth at him is the Antichrist. He is the one. He is that wicked man that is going to be exalted and will exalt wickedness. He's called the man of sin. And so this is the Lord's uh, protection in that tribulation period. Notice the Lord said that he would set him in safety. Well, you certainly can't look back at the Jews and say that's been true. The Lord didn't set the Jews in safety under Adolf Hitler. Killed six million of them. I mean, can you imagine a Jew reading that as he goes to the gas chamber? Oh, this has a prophetic uh, a, a picture here of when the Lord delivers that remnant in the tribulation. Notice it again, if you will, that they will speak openly with their lips and with their heart. In verse 2 it says, They speak every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak. Flattery is the most subtle deception. I preached a message on flattery Thursday evening. And with flattery, would you turn to Daniel chapter 11? Let me show you, just to add a little more uh, circumstantial evidence here. Would you go to Daniel um, chapter 11? Daniel 11, and look at verse 21. Once again, the chapter is talking about the Antichrist and how he takes over the kingdom. And by the way, that country over there is just about ready for somebody to take over and straighten that mess out. Not even the United Nations can get it worked out. But there's a man coming who will, and it's not the Savior. We look at the text. Uh, it says in Daniel 11, verse 21, And in his estate, that's the Antichrist, in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom how? By flatteries. So you have a reference in Psalm 12 to the Antichrist using flattery and diplomacy and his lips to destroy the, the seed, the remnant. And that's what chapter 12 is talking about. Now the Lord rescues the needy. Notice it says they cry to the Lord. He said, help, Lord. That's, the, that's how it starts out. Help, Lord. Well, Jesus said, you will not see me until the day you cry, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. The last time they saw him, they said, crucify him. We will not have this man to reign over us. But the time is coming, that little remnant will find themselves enclosed on every side. And they will simply have to cry out to the Lord for help. For their own people will fail them. And these in the tribulation will find that the nations are against them. Even their own people will betray them. And their only escape will be to call on the Lord. Would you turn to the book of Joel? I, I, you need to see this. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Please find it. Joel chapter 2. This, these will cry to the Lord. In Joel chapter 2, and look at verse 30. Joel 2, verse 30. In Joel 2, verse 30, God said, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. Talking about the tribulation period. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord to come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Help, Lord, they say. And the context is right here before the terrible day of the Lord. And look at it again. Verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. In the remnant. There is going to be a remnant that's going to be pinned in on every side. The godly will be exalted with flattery. The Antichrist takes the kingdom, and this little remnant will find there's no hope for them. And right in the middle of this tribulation period, they cry to the Lord, Help, Lord! And God sends deliverance in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, wonder of wonders, the Apostle Paul <laughs> did something that you and I have to be very careful of doing. 
He took this text out of context and applied it to every Christian in this age, Romans 10, 13, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that something? The text here is talking about physical deliverance out of the tribulation. But for you, it's talking about spiritual salvation so you don't have to go to hell. For whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's how you get saved today. You know you're a sinner. You know you deserve to go to hell. You believe Jesus died for you and you call on him and he saves you. But I want you to see the text is talking about Israel in the tribulation. Not only that, they comfort themselves with God's faithful word. Go to chapter 12, Psalm 12, and look at verse 6. Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now, you'll notice the words of the wicked are flattery and deceit. You'll notice in the text you have the words of the wicked and their mouth. Now you have the contrast, the words of God and his faithfulness. And it is with their words that God's people are made merchandise, the words of the wicked. And the only faithful word is the word of a faithful God. His words, unlike the words of the wicked, are pure. In fact, they are, you'll notice that it is his words that are pure. If I were you, I'd underline that. It's words. Now, folks, there's a difference in the word word and the difference in the word words. Because it is the words of God that are pure. Some folks talk about the word being pure, but having the wrong words. No, it has the right words. Jesus Christ said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one word, jot or tittle, will pass from my word. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's the words that are pure. Now, you better get that. And by the way, if you have a Bible that... that uh, that has mis, uh, misinterpreted verse 6, the, the ver, or verse 7. Verse 7 is talking about the Word of God. So if you have something there that alludes to the, to the nation of Israel or to, to people, you have a corrupt translation. See? In fact, it, it's almost a Jehovah's Witness reading. The correct reading is this, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them... O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. It's the word of God that's preserved forever, not the Jews, not those people. They've been destroyed down through the centuries. This book is what's preserved. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. Thou shalt preserve them forever. You know why you need a faithful, preserved word of God? Because men are unfaithful. They speak wickedly. They speak with flattering lips. So everybody needs a faithful word they can turn to. And you don't need to join the Book of the Month Club to do that. Just get a good King James Bible and hang on to it. Just hang on to it. It's like Coke. It's the real thing. It is. Some folks talk about the original Greek being the real thing. Well, you never had a copy. And you couldn't get a copy. Thank you. Uh, have a nice day. They comfort themselves with the Word of God. Thirdly, the salvation of the godly. Look at verse 5 of chapter 12. Look at verse 5. For the oppression of the poor. Do you think God has been uh, getting up to stop the oppression of the poor in the last 4,000 years? I don't. But the time is coming when he will. And the poor here, once again, refers to that remnant. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor. The, 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 once again, we're back to the remnant, and it is for that remnant. You know why they're going to be poor? Because their own people are going to cast them out. They won't be able to find jobs. They won't be able to survive unless somebody takes care of them. Unless somebody takes care of them. No wonder you read in Matthew chapter 25, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. No wonder James says, Woe unto you, rich men. In the tribulation period. These people are going to have to live from house to house and they'll be hunted like a, like a, like a, like a rabbit or, a, or, 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 a, or they'll be uh, looked for like a, like a fisherman looks for a fish. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise. I've underlined that. Now will I arise. 
You ever wonder how many people have died over the last years trying on the Lord? Huh? People calling on the Lord to deliver them and he doesn't deliver them? God seems to be indifferent. Matter of fact, there's a great book out called The Silence of God. Why is God silent? But he is. It seems that God is indifferent. It seems that God has been indifferent for 2,000 years. You stand by a bed and you pray for a loved one that's dying. Sometimes it seems like God is not listening. You know your heart is right. You love the Lord. You've prayed. But they die. Little child dies. Grandma dies. Brother and sister die. Mom and, mom and dad die. And it seems that God is indifferent. But I am telling you, God is not indifferent. God just has a time schedule. And God may not raise you up from a deathbed, but he'll raise you up from a grave. I promise you that. He'll raise you up from the grave. Because I live, you will live also, he said. Now, I'm like you. I want a loved one raised today, but I tell you, eventually they're going to die. When are we going to ever be willing to give people up? We never will be. We're not going to be willing to give them up. My mother's 14 years. I have 100 years old. I'm no more ready to give her up than I ever was. And I never will be ready to give her up. I'm going to have to. And you're going to have to give up the folks you love. So it would help if you could just get your mind conditioned for that and trust the Lord. Because God is faithful. His word is faithful. Now will I arise. Would you, that's this word arise here, that's an interesting thing. It shows up eight times in the Psalms. Go to Psalm, would you go to Psalm chapter 3, verse 7? I did some research, a little study on this, and uh, about the only place it talks about the Lord arising is in the Psalms. Everywhere else it's God telling man to arise and do such and such. In Psalm 3, arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For thou hast smitten all mine enemies up on the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Sounds pretty rough, doesn't it? You're looking at a tribulation situation. Look at uh, chapter 7 and verse 6. Look at chapter 7, verse 6. Arise, O Lord, in thy anger. Lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies. Awake for me for the judgment that thou hast commanded. Let's go to chapter 9. Look at verse 19, 919. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. That sounds like a good missionary to me. You don't find Paul for like that. You've got to look at this thing in the, in the light of the prophecy it's talking about. Again, the enemy is to be destroyed in the tribulation period. Look at chapter 44. Look at verse 23, 44, 23. 44.23 Awake! Why sleepest thou, O Lord? Arise! Cast us not off forever. One more time. Psalm 132, verse 8. Arise, O Lord, in thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. You see, uh, in the time of Solomon, the glory of the Lord went into Solomon's temple. Ezekiel sees that glory depart in the book of Ezekiel. The Lord departed from Israel, the glory is departed. The old lazy priest, Eli, called the son was called Ichabod because the glory of the Lord had departed. That glory returned in the person of Jesus, and he went to the temple and he cleansed it, but rather than them receiving the glory of God, they crucified him. And he said, Woe to them, for your house is left unto you desolate. But I'm telling you, the time is coming when God will rise and the glory of the Lord will come back into a new temple built in Jerusalem. And the Lord will arise and he will defend that remnant of Jews. Would you turn to Isaiah 60? After the Lord arises, watch what happens. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. That's Israel. 
For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and the gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Now there's nothing as pathetic as a Gentile trying to make those verses apply to him. It's pathetic. When the glory of the Lord shines upon Israel, the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cut a sea. In fact, you won't even have to go soul winning. Because the Bible says, all will know me from the least to the greatest. So then when Jesus was on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The heavens were silent. Millions of Jews have called upon the Lord for deliverance, but the heavens were silent. However, the time is coming, and the Psalms describe it, when the Lord will arise to save his remnant people. Would you turn to Romans chapter 10? Romans 10, please. Romans 10, and look, if you will, at verse 9. Romans 10, 9. <clears throat> you say, Pastor Blue, what, what, what's this sermon got for me? I'll show you what it's got for you. First of all, everything I've said ought to clarify so you're not trying to cash false checks. I mean, that ought to help you more than anything. But maybe you need what Romans 10, 9 says. It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart a man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. Well, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Well, in Psalms, there's a difference between the Jew and the Greek. In the Old Testament law, there was a difference between the Jew and the Greek. In the Gospels, there was a difference between the Jew and the Greek. In the tribulation period, there will be a difference between the Jew and the Greek. But today, there is no difference, none whatsoever. There's no difference when it comes to the matter of God's favor and God's love and God's salvation. There's no difference between the male and the female, the bond or the free, the Greek, the Jew or the Gentile. There's no difference. No one today has the advantage. The Jew had the advantage for years. He no longer has the advantage. No one does. Christ is available to any man, woman, boy, or girl who wants him. All you've got to know is that you're a sinner and you want the Savior. That's it. Couldn't be any easier. You know what it means? It means to trust him. He died on the cross in your place. To trust him. Watch this. It just means trust him. <laughs> I'm trusting the chair. It's doing all the work. And if that chair could talk, would it be groaning? But I'm trusting it. I'm not trusting it now. I'm trusting it now. And you see, you don't mix trust with baptism or trust with confirmation or trust with communion or trust with good works or trust with good intentions or trust with anything else. You just trust him. He died on the cross for you. He paid your debt. You just trust him. You could do that, can't you? You can't trust Jesus Christ. Who can you trust? You say, well, I don't know if he'll accept me. Well, you're not the issue. He's the issue. There's nothing in the Bible saying he's supposed to accept you. You don't get saved by him accepting you. You get saved by you accepting him. You say, I don't know if I'm worthy. Let me help you out. You're not. You say, well, I just feel like I'm such a sinner. Let me help you out. You are. You say, well, I just deserve to go to hell. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Amen to everything you've said. Now, why don't you say the right thing? You're a dirty, rotten sinner, and you trust Jesus as your Savior. And that'll settle it. That'll settle it. God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He's not waiting for you to clean up your act so he can save you. Because if you got your act cleaned up, you wouldn't want to be saved. Right. Self-righteousness is your biggest problem anyway.